Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we can get started. Do we have enough people? Yeah. Uh, we've got 13. Okay. Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, everybody is muted. Uh, please stay muted if you have any questions. Please put them in the chat and Sarah will handle them afterwards. Uh, so welcome to our third uh, digital preservation school. Thank you guys for being okay with this and, you know, keeping up with it. Uh, this is our uh, research class. Um, it is more focused on uh, cultural resources. So it's not just your standard how to generally um, research a building. Our other preservation schools, both virtual and post this IRL are available on our website, on our preservation school page, and also on our YouTube. We also have many other uh, videos on our YouTube page, so please check that out. We will have one more preservation school next week about reading architectural drawings. It will be on Thursday at 6 p.m. And then after will also be available um, on our website and our YouTube page. And with that, I will hand it over to Sarah. Hi, um, uh, my name is Sarah Bean Atman. I'm the Director of Research for, and uh, of Research and Preservation for Village Preservation, formerly known as Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. Um, and uh, today we're going to look at researching cultural resources. Um, Michelle just said that uh, we're, you know, this isn't focused on um, uh, documenting a building in terms of its date and architect and stuff like that, but we actually are going to look at that because you can't, you can't um, understand a building as a cultural resource unless you know how long it's been around um, and other information that might yield more cultural resource information. Uh, so we're going to cover both areas. Um, just to give you a little background on me, um, before I started working for Village Preservation, I worked as an architectural historian uh, for a historic preservation company that I shared with another woman. And we did uh, historic structure surveys, we did state and national register nominations, we did section 106 reviews, a variety of preservation services, primarily around the tri-state area. Um, and I was, I was uh, trained in New York City uh, with my master's in historic preservation, and now I feel like I've come full circle coming back to New York City. So, um, so as I said, we're going to look at uh, documenting basic stuff for a building first, just in terms of when it was built, uh, who the architect was. Uh, then we're going to look at stuff like who lived there or who, what, what businesses might have been there or what organizations might have been there. And this yields, could yield possible uh, significant cultural um, histories. Um, I'm going to be sticking with mostly resources that are available online. I'm doing that because of, in light of our current circumstances, uh, it just seemed the way to go right now. I will mention a couple of resources that you can hit uh, when things open up again that can help you in documenting your building, but the focus will be on online resources. And um, I'm going to send HDC a list of these, these sites so it's easy enough for you to click and open them up yourself. Um, we're going to end with looking at a case study of a building that was designated an individual New York City landmark, specifically based on its cultural significance. So forgive me, I'm using two screens, so I have to keep going back and forth. So getting ready to do research, um, always a good idea to start with a list of resources, which will differ depending on what area you're researching. Um, I also am very big on what I refer to as a research diary, documenting sources I'm hitting, what I'm finding, and it's also just as important to document the sources that you've hit and didn't find anything. Um, I don't believe in reinventing the wheel, and sometimes, it, for, for my purposes, I'm frequently doing this with other people, or other people are looking at my notes later, so they know where I've been, 
but even just in terms of my own sanity, because I'll wake up at three in the morning and said, oh God, did I look at that resource? Um, so keeping a research diary in terms of what you're finding and where is a great idea. And then, as I said, uh, getting ready to look at a building or a site uh, for possible cultural significance, we have to start out with the basics, which is your built architect, use, and owner. If you find out that something significant happened and it was before the building was built, this may not be as important. So you need to know that kind of basic information. Um, so one of the first sources I always hit is the um, New York City GIS map. Um, it gives you, there's a lot of information that it can yield. Uh, one of the most important things for researching, especially with New York City resources, is understanding the block and lot number. Um, again, I'm putting the uh, links down here, but I will send those to you afterwards so you don't have to write them down or anything. Um, so I put in uh, where uh, actually HDC is and where pres uh, Village Preservation is, and I miss my office very much. <laughs> I'm looking forward to going back to it, uh, 232 East 11th Street. And when I do that, uh, it shows me the building here and it gives me a lot of relevant information about the building over on the right-hand side. Uh, the information that is, uh, is, is kind of important when you're doing research is the block and lot numbers, and you'll see why as we go through this. Um, the uh, one thing I want to caution everybody about, and I always mention this, is buildings that were built prior to World War I frequently have the wrong building date on this map. Um, you can see right here that it says that 232 East 11th Street was built in 1935. It was not. It was built in 1899, actually. Um, I, I wish and I have pled with the city that they should just say unknown if they don't know it. Um, but uh, for now, this is what we're dealing with. But I always, anytime I give a lecture on this, I always put that information out there because I'm frequently um, called by people who insist that um, the date that I might have for a building is wrong or, or the designation report is wrong because they saw it on New York City GIS. Um, so as I said, this map has, has a lot of um, other great information. The, um, there's there's um, filters that you can check here to identify different things. For my purposes, what I'm frequently looking at is to see if a building is already identified as a New York City landmark. And um, checking those boxes right here, I'm able to put those filters on the map. And as you can see, the building that we were just looking at at 232 East 11th Street is part of the St. Mark's Historic District. Um, so armed with that information, we know block and lot, um, we know the address, um, we can go to the Department of Buildings website, the building information system, and um, check out possible information we'll find out about the building. Um, so uh, here I can, I put in uh, the address, sorry, this is the problem with Zoom. Um, and, um, but you can also do it by block and lot, as I said, with the borough here. You can also see what's going on within a block just by browsing the block. Um, and so for 232 East 11th Street, uh, this is the information that pops up and we see, oh, look, it's a landmark. Um, over here, we have permits that have been filed. Uh, they show permits back to about the 1990s. Um, you could also find out violations if in case you're interested. Uh, but for the purposes of researching the building, uh, especially a historic building that was built prior to that, I look at this tab, this, this file right here called Actions. And Actions is gonna have some information. Everything is not perfect. <laughs> when it, uh, a lot of the information from DOB um, is uh, for historic information is missing or sometimes mislabeled. So you have to be a really good detective and keep pursuing um, the information. So in this case, what I found was I see a series of alterations that happened here in, uh, the, in the 20th century. Here's what I'm looking for. And this is the new building permit. And it shows it uh, building number, uh, new building permit number 1536. And it says 99. I just told you that it was built in 1899, and you can see they have a mistake over here. They say 1999. Um, so again, just keep searching uh, and don't uh, uh, to find the right information. Um, now, uh, I 
also say that never reinvent the wheel. Um, if your building is a New York City landmark, you can find out a lot of information, including this basic information we're looking for in terms of building date and architect, um, uh, and that you can identify. We identified it first through the GIS map that I showed you, but you can also go to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission website, and they have uh, Discover Your New York City Landmarks map right here, this, uh, which I'll show you in a second. In case you're interested, they also have permits back to 2016 right here. Um, and there's a lot of information you can look at here as well as upcoming hearings that are happening with the New York City landmarks. Um, so for 232 East 11th Street, I zoomed in on the map that show, identifies landmarks and it gives me two pop-ups and here we have the construction date, we have the architect, we have who the original owner was. On the second page of the pop-up, I'm able to access the de designation report, which will give me more information about the district itself and hopefully the building. Um, and the reason why I said hopefully the building is the older the designation, the older designation reports are much less comprehensive than current designation reports. Um, so you, uh, you can usually find your building in the very old ones, um, but sometimes not so much. Um, but uh, th this also gives you a basic history of the district itself. And again, if your building is part of a district or an individual landmark that was, le that was done later, back in the 80s and the 90s, into the 2000s, you're going to find quite a lot of information in them. Um, also, I encourage you, depending on where you are in the city, to research to find out who the local advocacy group is, historical society, um, and see what kind of documentation those, those places have. Um, as I said, I work for Village Preservation. We have documented a number of buildings which are not designated. Uh, in the East Village, we did a huge survey, uh, which we have available online through East Village building blocks. Uh, we also have a civil rights and social justice map that we've created of sites that, that speak to that. Um, we also have documented sites that um, we wanted designated, but weren't designated. And so we have those files as well. And as I said, other organizations like ours or historical societies can be a great resource for finding out that information. Um, so when we were looking before at the uh, Department of Buildings website, um, I pointed out the building, the new building uh, number and the year. And for buildings that were built between 1900 and 1986, uh, you can turn to the Metropo Office of Metropolitan History, which has, uh, for Manhattan at least, the database of all the new building permits between 1900 and 1986. And in this case, what I did was I put in the block on VA 7th Avenue, um, and I found out it said uh, that it was uh, in 1930, and I put in the NB here, and I was able to identify it as a building that was built um, by, uh, designed by Rosario Candela, and also that it cost a million dollars to build, which is unheard of now. So, uh, so this is another great resource. Um, another resource that I turn to, particularly for um, possibly seeing interior designs, is the um, uh, historic occupancy records, the initial inspection cards. The, in this case, uh, I did a search for 124 McDougal Street, which is an old law tenement. And um, this was kind of a rich find because uh, the, the building, there was the initial plan was drawn, uh, I believe, in 1910. I got to move this over to check. Oh, 1908. So this was drawn in 1908. And then you can see these changes that were done in red, speaking to an alteration done in 1940. And those are indicated here. So these are like more, you know, interesting resources for your building to, to find out more about it. This is one of my favorites. So the um, New York City uh, Municipal Archives has in it a number of things in its collection. Um, one of the things is that it has the photos that were taken the late 1930s into 1940. Um, they also have what, were, what which we call tax photos. Um, they were also they also did this in the early 1980s. 
The 1980s photos have been available online for a while now. The resolution is not real strong, but you can order prints if you're interested. And then they just released online about a year and a half ago, the 1940s tax photos. The resolution is really good on these photos. And both those photos, as well as the other photo archives, help us figure out um, you know, possible changes that happen to buildings. We can also see businesses sometimes in these buildings, which is uh, a, a huge resource. Um, and it's, it's also, frank, frankly, just fun to look through. The 1940s tax photos um, uh, are kind of addictive. So in this case, what I did was, uh, so how to do a search. Um, I'm in the Manhattan photos. They have them for the other boroughs as well. And I put in here the block and the lot number. And what I got, which is the block and lot number for 232 East 11th Street that we were looking at before. And so this shows it in 19, around 19, the late 1930s into early 40. And then uh, this is it today. And I just wanted to point this out because look at this gorgeous porch that used to be on the building. Uh, which has since been taken down, which leads out to the graveyard at St. Mark's Church. Uh, so the, this is another one where, again, documenting how the chain, building has changed over time. Um, other photo archives, New York has such great archives. I think it, it's, I re, as I said, when my in my earlier life, when I researched around the tri-state area and actually I had gone up to Massachusetts and researched, I think New York has the best archives um, that you're going to find. Um, so other photo archives and other information you might find on buildings, other great resources. Again, a lot of them are all digital. New York Historical Society, New York Public Library digital collection. Um, the New York Public Library also has it via a map, which is much easier, I think. Um, so if you click on a site, it will bring up the maps for that area. Um, M Museum of the City of New York. Um, but there's also Urban Archive which has condensed a lot of these resources, um, including they have, uh, they have access to our the village preservation's historic images. Um, so it becomes one-stop shopping, and I'll show that to you in a second. I also always recommend looking at the Library of Congress digital collection, which is quite extensive, and you never know what you're gonna find in there. Um, pleasantly surprised sometimes. So in the case of Urban Archives, I clicked on Tompkins Square Park, and here are all the historic photos that they found that they scraped from the Museum of the City of New York, from New York Public Library, and from Village Preservation are all in one place. Um, and then the fire insurance maps um, from New York Public Library are a tremendous resource in terms of understanding a building and its changes over time and when possibly when it was built as well. Um, they have it for they have these for each borough. They um, are are different years depending on where you are. Um, and uh, I'll show you uh, an example of how I've used it to try and understand a building site a little bit better. So uh, we have someone in the office um, who uh, lives at 149 First Avenue, and he was saying that he lives in this old back house. And so we got curious, and we decided to try and figure out when it was built. Um, and uh, so just using the maps and not using any detailed records, such as tax records or something that we typically turn to, um, we were able to see that it was built between 1853 and 1859. So here's the site currently. And here's the back house where our friend lives. Um, in the 1853 map, we can see that it's not there. And by the 1859 map, it's there. So that now we have a range of years of when that was built. Um, also, you should note that um, while right now this, this site is 149 First Avenue, um, street numbers have changed. So this is very common in uh, New York City addresses. And so it's something to always bear in mind in terms of doing your research and understanding where you're looking. Um, here's another one where, again, the historic maps, as well as another source that I'm going to tell you about, helped me out. Uh, this is 244 East Houston Street. Um, it's pretty bare bones, so it's not the kind of building where I could look at it and possibly tell from style or something like that, possibly when it was built. Here it is on a current map. And so I looked at um, some of the 1890s map, and I'm looking at the footprints of the building. The footprint, uh, for those of you that don't know, is basically, you know, 
what you're looking at if you lifted it out of the sand, uh, the imprint that it would make, the exterior of it. Um, so in this case, what I see is very different thing going on here between 1891 and 1899, 1897 rather. And to me, this is, you know, based a little bit on past knowledge that I have, but it's telling me that it looks like these were, these four were built together. Um, different, different producers of different maps uh, stress different things. The Sanborn maps are particularly good at outlining exact footprints, which is what why I brought up the 1903 Sanborn map, even though I, I knew that it was probably built by then as of the 1897 map. Um, and it shows me the um, indents between the buildings here, which is telling me that this is probably uh, old law tenements. So um, armed with the information that it looks like this building was built between 1891 and 1897, um, I turned to the, to the 1940s tax photos. And here I can see the four buildings that look remarkably similar, um, all standing there. Um, what a shame that the little one that's left lost its cornice. Um, and then um, through uh, Google Street Map, uh, I'm sorry, Google Aerial View, I can see the, the indent that I was talking about before that we saw in the 1903 Sanborn map. So we're pretty sure that we're looking at the same building. Um, there is, uh, there, as of 1866 was when New York City started issuing permits. In 1868, uh, a weekly publication was being published called the Real Estate Record and Builder's Guide. And as of 1878, it was indexed for new buildings. And so it was indexed every six months. So you're able to look up a street number um, for a series of years and narrow it down. So I'm between 1891 and 1897 based on the map. And in 1892, I was able to find out oh, these four buildings, four or five story buildings were built. I'm able to see the architect. Um, and um, even how much it cost. Um, so these are the basic things in terms of understanding when your building was there to, under, to, to further your research. So then the next question is, if we're going to start looking into possible cultural significance, is when was there? And there's a bunch of sources for that as well. Um, the first one, this was uh, New York Public Library recently released, uh, not recently, I guess now, it's been a few years, um, the New York City directories, which date back to the 18th century. Uh, they released them up to about 1923. There are a few sporadic ones after 1923, um, but it, it's, it's like a phone directory without a phone number in the early ones. And it even identifies uh, people's, um, people's uh, uh, professions or whom they were working for. Um, so this is a tremendous resource. In the case of using the New York Public Library's collection of New York City directories, you need a name though. You, they don't allow a, um, a search in the individual directory by like a keyword or something like that. So in this case, if you know the name of the person you're looking for, you can find out where they lived again within a span of years. And I showed an example right here of 1850, uh, from the 1855-56 directory. Um, we were doing research on Thomas Nast, uh, for those of you that don't know, was a political cartoonist um, and in the 19th century. And we found out that he had been taking art classes on 13th Street while he was living in Five Points. And then another source uh, told us it was at the National Academy of Design. We didn't know the National Academy of Design was on 13th Street at this time. So through the directories, I was able to determine that for about 10 years in the 1850s to 60s, the National Academy of Design had temporary headquarters at 58 East 13th Street. Um, this was prior to when they, they built their first purpose-built building on 23rd Street and were able to move there. Um, I was also able to bring up the um, old annals of, from the 19th century of the National Academy of Design. And I was able to find out, oh, they, they sort of moved in there uh, because it was their secretary of the, tre their treasury guy's um, art studio. And it was supposed to be just for a year and it just kept going and going. So for 10 years, they were at this building, um, which again, I was able to uh, figure out, fine tune that through this, through this resource. 
Um, there are um, online sources that have the New York City directories, um, for, you know, in, in random years. Um, but with these sources, such as Google Books or Happy Trust in this case, you can do a term search. You can do a, a, a word search or an address search. Um, and in this case, what happened was um, uh, one of the people in my office was writing about 86 University Place. I know it says 56, I'll explain that in a second. He was searching 86 University Place and he said, is it fair to say that this started out as a row house for merchants? And I said, you know what? We just had a case where 58 East 13th Street, which presented like a row house was in fact a, 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 a for artist studios let me just double check so i was able to do I, I was able to go to the maps the historic maps that i showed you see what the historic address was put it into say in this case the 1845 directory put it as a search term and um we found out that this gentleman benjamin ha hazard field lived there and then i figured out the years he was there and i brought up his obituary and it turned out he was a very significant 19th century figure um, uh, uh, he was involved in a lot of ph philanthropic um, things in New York City. He um, was one of the people who led uh, the, the New York Free Circulating Library, a precursor to the New York Public Library. He also um, started the um, Home for the Incur Incurables, which was the first hospital for people with um, diseases that couldn't be cured. Um, and we found out he was really quite a significant figure from the 19th century. So I think that th that story is you just never know what you're going to get. Um, so another great source to try and figure out who lived there uh, is um, the census records. Uh, I primarily rely on Ancestry.com. Before the pandemic, um, if someone wanted to further their research on ancestry, and, and it's more than just census records. I mean, you can see here, there's birth and death, uh, marriage certificates, uh, immigration records, um, military records. I found a friend's father's, you know, World War II card on this once. Um, there's all kinds of things. But, you know, it's, it, ancestry is, um, you need a subscription. So you could go to the New York City Public Library um, uh, branches to access their account. They also have other things like the New York Times archive, which again is something you'd, you'd normally have to pay for um, and just use it through the library. And um, with what's happened with the pandemic, what they have done is if you're a New York Public Library card carrying member, you can now access those resources online. Uh, which is tremendous. So, um, so have fun with this one. This was a case, uh, the one that I have up right here, it was a case of a woman who was trying to figure out if her grandparents were married in Italy or were married in New York City. Um, uh, she was trying to get uh, dual citizenship with Italy. Um, so this is uh, another uh, resource that we use to try and identify people um you know were they immigrants who was occupying that building um this is one of the greatest things of all time this is one step web pages by stephen morse and he has basically made it so much easier to look through these these kinds of records and you can see in the upper left hand corner the the records that he has and um the one that i am frequently turning to is the census finder here 1880 to 1950. 1950 isn't quite correct. That's not gonna, the 1950 census is not gonna be released until 2022. There's a rule for census records that there's uh, 72 years between when they're taken and when they're released, um, but that's coming out in 2022. So through this, I'm able to put in an address and it takes me right to the page of that census record. Um, it used to be that um, when I didn't have this resource, I would have to figure out who was living there, put in their name, and then I could see everybody who was living in a building. Now I'm able to go right to the building, which is great. Um, there is one thing here though, the um, New York City, uh, New York City record, the, the federal censuses, excuse me, the federal censuses for New York City started recording addresses with the second enumeration in 1870. 
And that's something you can't access from here. Um, you can get it through Ancestry.com through a search. Um, so as of then, you have the addresses. There were two enumerations done in 1870. If you're looking for an address, you always want the second one, not the first one, because it doesn't have address, addresses. And prior censuses, the 1860 census, the 1850 census don't have addresses. Um, and that's also rare, and this is why I love researching in New York City, because I tried to do my own home out here in Long Island, and they weren't doing address until like 1940. So, um, so the, but the New York City ones are great. Um, there's also New York State census records, which were done certain years. Um, those you can also get through Ancestry and also through Stephen Morse. Um, another great resource, and newspaper is wonderful. You never know what you're going to get when you start researching an address or a person or, you know, a club or something like that. Um, as I mentioned, there's the New York Times, which I turn to all the time, which you can now get through New York Public Library. Um, that was how I got the obituary for Benjamin Hazard um, Field that I was showing you before when we were looking at 86 uh, University Place. Um, and uh, this one, though, has a whole bunch of newspapers divided up by area. So in this case, you can click down on Manhattan and it shows you all the, all the newspapers that you can do, that you can search through with a term. Um, you can also just pick out a newspaper and just search that newspaper with that term. And um, with businesses, businesses are really hard to, to research. I get calls about those all the time. Um, and the best source really are the newspapers. Uh, in the case of the, the newspapers for Manhattan, they do go back quite a ways to the early 1800s. Um, and then, you know, other searches, I mean, really basic, just a Google search and Google Books can yield all kinds of things. Um, Google Books is, can be a little frustrating because sometimes they um, only give you parts of books, which can drive me crazy, but it can be a great jumping off point. In this case, what we were doing was we were trying to figure out where Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward lived on East 11th Street. We had another source that identified them living there. Um, and so we were trying to find out where they lived and um, I was able to pull up this book. Unfortunately, we were never able to figure out the street address. Um, and we had one woman saying she lived across the street and it was this address, another so source saying it was another so. Um, but but um, looking at Google Books, and again, online resources um, is really helpful. And then the other one I turn to frequently for books uh, when I have to look at them online is Internet Archive. Um, in this case, uh, we were researching 55 Fifth Avenue. Um, it's where there was a recording studio that, studio that John Hammond was first recording artists, including black artists. Um, it was where Billie Holiday had her first recording. Um, and this, so with Internet Archive, what's kind of interesting is the book is like if you're in a library. So if I request a book, sometimes I'm told, oh, you're on a waiting list for it. And then I have 14 days to read it. Um, but it's still a tremendous resource. And again, you know, when, when it's an online resource, as opposed to a physical book, although I still always love physical books, um, you can search by a term and you can get right to the information. Um, so now I'm going to just give you a case study um, of 827, 831 Broadway, um, which was, um, these are uh, twin buildings, uh, Civil War era, um, known sort of as marble palaces, um, and they took their inspiration from the Italian Palazzi, um, a Palazzi and um, what happened with this was in 2016, a new building permit was filed for 827 Broadway, which is this one right here. Um, so we initially did research on that building, not wanting to have a new building at this location and wanting to preserve this beautiful architecture. And um, we submitted it to the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, and the, uh, the request for eligibility for, as a landmark was rejected. Subsequently, in 2017, demolition permits were filed for the whole site. So we expanded our research to also 831 Broadway. And that was when we found out that Willem de Kooning actually had his studio and lived here. 
we resubmitted to the Landmarks Preservation Commission with this additional knowledge, um, as well as we found out there were a number of mid 20th century art, um, artists um, and people in the art world who lived here, um, and that was a game changer. Um, so these buildings were identified and, and ultimately, ultimately designated, actually. Um, and they were, they were, their significance was called out not for the 1866 architecture, um, but rather for the fact that they are, you can, I put the statement of significance right here about the fact that they are associated with prominent artists of the New York School and represent that pivotal era post-World War II in New York City, where it became the center of the art world. Um, so, um, so now I'm just going to show you some of the research um, that was done for these buildings, uh, again, elaborating on their cultural resource uh, as a cultural resource and looking at some of the sources that we used. Um, so again, you know, I said that we, before we do anything, we gotta figure out when this was built, who built it, that kind of thing. Uh, this was kind of interesting. I, I mentioned before New York started issuing permits in 1866. Um, in this case, this was the 18th new building permit ever issued in New York City. So we were very lucky. If they had actually tried to build it just a few months earlier, we may never have known who the architect was and who owned it. And it was owned by uh, Peter Lorillard, um, also known as Pierre Lorillard III, a uh, prominent tobacco family. Um, and the architect was Griffith Thomas, um, and it, you know this was the information that we were able to get, and this was all through municipal archives. Um, they have uh, they have the um, dockets of the new building permits. This again, I, I was trying not to stress the sources that aren't available online, but when the world opens up again. The Municipal Archives has a plethora of information, including old tax records. So if there's buildings that are prior to 1866 um, and or we can't find the new building permit, um, the tax records can be quite illuminating as far as understanding when a building was built or how it was changed and stuff. Um, as I said, they have the new building docket books. Um, they also have um, the photos that I talked about before with the 1940s. Um, and they also, um, underneath 39th Street, for buildings underneath 39th Street in Manhattan, they have what are called block and lot folders, which are, show the permits that DOB also has, the old permits, um, alteration, new building, this kind of thing. Um, so I just took a little aside with that. Um, so anyway, as I said, Griffith Thomas was uh, the architect. He um, he was uh, a significant architect from the 19th century called the most fashionable architect of his generation by American Institute of Architects in 1908. Margot Gale called him among the best architects in the city, placing him alongside Richard Morris Hunt, uh, John B. Snook, uh, and William, uh, Isaac Duckworth. And um, the Grove Encyclopedia of American Art called him one of the first architects in the USA to popularize popularized the Italian Palazzo mode and one of the first American architects to adopt the French Second Empire style. Um, so here's the first bit of information that we were able to find. Um, it was built as a commercial structure. Uh, there were a number of commercial um, entities that went through it throughout the years. Uh, it was, uh, this image shows it uh, when it was home to, in 1874, when it was home to Wilson's Sewing Machine Room, uh, which was there from 1874 to 1881. Uh, and this, it was, this was back in an era when the, uh, this stretch, uh, which leads up to Ladies Mile, uh, was the place to shop, um, and elegant shopping was available. Other commercial enterprises that had their homes over the years included the Mechanical Organette Company, uh, which sold reed organ organs, and A.A. A. Ventine uh, and Company, which is a purveyor of Japanese goods. And a lot of this information we found through just basic Google searches. Oh, and also newspapers. Um, so here's an image of it from 1899. And we see that it's, it's pretty much uh, very similar to the way it is today. So it's intact to the, the time primarily of how it was built. Um, here's the 1940s tax photo that we were talking about before. And Buildings such as 827 and 831, um, 
uh, started to adapt. As the area changed, um, uh, you know, artists started to become attracted to this kind of loft commercial building um, because of the abundance of natural light. They were also cheap. Um, and so attracting these artists, tenor, tenants, uh, this area south of Union Square started to become one of the lo uh, low rent sort of artist enclave uh, known as 10th Street. After World War II, New York City became the cradle of abstract expressionism as artists sought refuge from war torn Europe and museums and galleries unable to import the Europe, uh, import Europe art um, because of the started to showcase new work that was being produced in New York City. Uh, the informal association of these artists became known as the New York School and became synonymous with the abstract expressionist movement. And This is a picture that we have in actually um, our archive as well. Um, he was here until 1862. Um, this is a picture by um, uh, Dan Budnick. Uh, hold on, I just go back to the back to look at it. That's called, um, oh, I'm sorry, 831, uh, action painting 831 um, by the photographer Dan Budnick from 1962. Um, here's one of the paintings that was done while he was here. Um, while at 831, uh, which was he, his last New York City residence before he moved out east on Long Island, um, de Kooning began to experiment with vivid tones and he moved away from the, the dense urban landscapes that he had done pro pre previously uh, to more pastoral scenes. And we see this here in Rosie Figure, Dawn at Laos Point and from 1963. Um, Another important figure in the mid 20th century art world was uh, William Rubin, uh, renowned as the curator who transformed MoMA. Uh, he was the director of painting and sculpture department at MoMA from 1973 to 1988. From 1966 to 1974, while a curator at MoMA uh, and professor at Sarah Lawrence and the city, of, uh, the city University of New York, William Rubin rented a fourth floor apartment at 831 Broadway across the hall from the apartment of William de, Willem de Kooning, um, which by that time he had let to uh, artist Paul Jenkins. In 1967, uh, Rubin's commis Rubin commissioned the um, then a relatively unknown architect, Richard Meyer, to renovate the interior into a, quote, flowing skylit space articulated by freestanding partitions. Um, and uh, this, is, this is an image showing Ruben hosting artists, uh, including uh, Larry Poons, who I'll get to. Um, and he had a, quite the collection of art, obviously, in his apartment as well. Um, Elaine de Kooning, um, Willem de Kooning's wife, uh, a writer for Art News, an artist herself, and a cultivator of the abstract expressionist movement during her separation from Willem de Kooning. Uh, from 1962 to 1966, she rented an apartment below his, which is strange, uh, with a separate entrance at number 827. In 1962, at this location, she finished her portrait of John F. Kennedy, a commission for the Truman Library, and now in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and after completing the commission, she continued to paint and sketch Kennedy um, until, unfortunately, the shock of his assassination, which caused her not to be able to paint for a year. Um, beginning in 1963, uh, Paul Jenkins rented the fourth floor of number 831, formerly Willem de Kooning's space, and he was there until 2001, uh, where he painted a, norm a number of notable works, including Phenomena 831 Broadway. Um, the 1965 documentary short film, The Ivory Knife, which is how he painted, he, he was famous for using this ivory knife for his paintings, um, was shot at this location. Um, and um, actually, one of the fun things was I got to meet the people who lived below him. He moved out in 2000, um, and Michael and Mishi Rob, who are also artists, have the apartment below. Um, and I learned that um, there were some shortcomings to having such an illustrious neighbor. He, um, Jenkins would 
put down his his you know large scale canvas or whatever he was working on on the floor and move paint around paint frequently spilled down and it frequently went into the Rob's apartment. <laughs> and uh, there was one point where apparently Michael Rob said, you know what, the next time a drip comes down through the wall, you've got to sign it. And in fact, Jenkins did that and it's still in their apartment. Um, he also, um, uh, Michael and Mishi talked about getting married and having a wedding reception in their studio at 831 Broadway and uninvited Jenkins showed up, but with one of his watercolors, which became a, um, a gift for the bride and groom. Uh, Jules Olitsky, who was here from 1870, I'm sorry, 1971 to 1980. Uh, he rent, rented a large apartment at 827 as his residence and studio. Uh, while at 827, Olitsky began to use smaller and vertical canvases and to roughen up the surfaces with gel thickened pigments to form sort of a skin on the canvas surface. Um, so this, uh, and this shows one of the paintings that he did during that time. Larry Poons moved um, into the former apartment of Rubin uh, in, in 1974 and is still there with his wife, who is also an artist, Paul De, Paula De Lucia. Paula De Lucia. Um, while at 831, he continued sort of more of his experimentation with um, different applications of the paint, um, uh, the splashing and the pouring uh, that, that started to really characterize his paintings in the 1970s. Um, he also started to, um, to start to use different uh, three-dimensional materials uh, in his paintings while he's been there. Um, and um, one of the things that we learned, again, I got to, uh, I was privileged enough to be able to go in to their studio. Um, and Paula told the story that she was still painting there at that studio. He had started, Larry had started to paint in their house upstate. One of the reasons that that happened was um, Howard Kaplan used to have the antique store that was at the storefront at 827, 831 Broadway. And um, Mr. Kaplan had these screens that were supposed to go to Cindy Lauper. Um, once again, paint spilled down through the wall and got Cindy Lauper's screens all uh, ruined. So <laughs> uh, good, good oral history stuff that comes through interviewing people. So then I'm just gonna just mention some of the resources that we consulted when we were doing the, these, this research. Um, getting an idea of understanding the, the culture and understanding the world that uh, these artists were living in, um, turning to Howard, uh, Harold Rosenberg rather, who was an art critic, um, was a great resource. Um, his book, uh, which has a collection of his articles from the Art News Annual, annual um, called Discovering the Present, Three Decades uh, in Art, Culture, and Politics, was a huge resource. Um, this book on de Kooning, which is relatively recent, it was done, I think it was published in 2006, um, was a, another tremendous resource in terms of understanding de Kooning and his art during this time. And then also Ninth Street Women. And in all these cases, whenever you're doing research, always, this may be obvious to a lot of people, but it may not be, and always look at the sources that they're using in their bibliographies and in their footnotes. Um, it's not stealing. It's, it's using their research and understanding, and it may take you in a different avenue than perhaps they were going with it. Um, another one was um, looking at articles which talked about this time from people who were there, in this case, Lionel Abel, um, talking about scenes from Cedar Bar, Cedar Tavern was where a lot of these artists hung out from the 10th Street um, group. Um, and so reading that and really getting immersed in the time and understanding what was going on. Um, also, never discount the experts. Um, turning to MoMA, looking at articles that they have on there. Um, about abstract expressionism. My knowledge before I started, my knowledge is still limited, but my knowledge was very limited before I started this, um, as far as this, uh, as, as, the, as an art movement in the 20th century. So turning to the experts through their website and also reaching out to them. Um, a lot of people are, are very willing to, to share their knowledge and um, understanding more information about the time and the setting and understanding why this is important. 
And then finally, um, the one thing that is always great to look at, especially with the um, more recent history, is any kind of oral history that might be out there. We happen to have this one um, by Paula Poons, uh, who talks about her time there uh, at, at 827, 831 Broadway, um, and the people who were there. Um, and uh, that, kind of, uh, um, that kind of information can just be invaluable. And so this sort of wraps up my, my presentation. Um, I, <laughs> I hope nobody's asleep at this point. Um, <laughs> and so I'm happy to take questions at this point. Um, I was gonna try and bring up the, the chats. Um, will you be sending the presentation to all of us? That is a Michelle question. Oh, I'm sorry, Simeon already answered it. Um, oh, and I don't see, I don't see any other questions. Um, just a, a nice thank you, which is great. <laughs> um, is there anybody that has anything? Yes, uh, can we unmute her? Um, who is raising their hand? Oh, there we go. <laughs> sorry, I could have done it the other way. <laughs> <laughs> With the blue hand, but I thought you might see me. So I, I guess I'm fascinated that such a beautiful building and, and, and a valuable building was only historically landmarked because of who lived in it. Does that happen often? That's just crazy. And thank goodness they lived there. Yes. Um, yeah, it happens too often. <laughs> um, but uh, well, what was interesting though, okay. So we got denied and we thought that these were pretty good buildings to start. I mean, 1866 is actually when cast iron was like still new. And so it's a combination of masonry and cast iron because architects were still kind of dubious about, hey, this is gonna work out. So we felt the architecture alone, as well as it being part of South of Union Square and the commercial development there was definitely significant enough. We were, we were turned down. And then when they found out about Willem de Kooning, then it, it turned around. Here's what happened though. At the LPC, Landmarks Preservation Commission hearing where the commissioners all started to talk, all of them started saying, this is valuable for its architecture and it's valuable as a cultural resource. <laughs> so it was, it was the kind of thing where, um, yeah, so it, it, it's frustrating. Um, always figure out a way to get them to pay attention, basically, because it won't just happen on the architectural value right off the bat. Sometimes it does. No, there's definitely, and, and if you can show, um, I mean, if, especially if you have something like, let's say it's the last uh, extant building uh, by a particular architect or of a particular style or in a particular area, you got a stronger case. Um, uh, not valuing this and its architecture wasn't that surprising, but albeit disappointing. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you. This is fast. I mean, you must learn so much just going in different directions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love this. You know, I get to do what I love, which is great. I feel very blessed for that. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the fun things is I learn about so much other stuff. I mean, you know, my running joke is my, one of my first jobs was researching this fish hatchery in Cold Spring Harbor. And then I found out all about fish hatcheries at the turn of 20th century. Who cares? But you know, you end up being an expert in these areas where you just don't think that you'll ever know anything. Fascinating. Um, Fascinating. Thank you. You're it's welcome. Class, really good. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, if there are no other questions, I think we can end it. Okay. Thank you all so much. We'll be sending out Sarah's PDF to everyone and the video will be available by the end of the week. I'm going to send out an email with all of the videos once we have finished the program next week, but the videos, um, the first video is already up. The second video uh, will be up probably by the end of the week as well. So the videos will be up and then I'll send the email with everything. Thank you again. Really You're good. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Stay safe.